today to Anthony Walker. Uh, and Anthony is originally from Swindon in the UK, not very far from here in Oxford. And he did his undergraduate degree in plant sciences at the University of Sheffield in, uh, in the Animal and Plant Sciences Department. He then spent a number of years working on an organic farm, landscaping, environmental project management, with a bit of world travel and a master's degree in sustainable agriculture from Y College, which is part of Imperial College London at the time. And for his master's thesis, he traveled to East Africa to study agricultural systems in uh, Western Kenya. And uh, he started his PhD with Ian Woodward at the University of Sheffield, where he studied how elevated CO2 experiments can help constrain ecosystem models. And uh, uh, then he moved to Oak Ridge National Lab in East Tennessee as a postdoc, and today he's a senior scientist there, still studying the effects of elevated CO2 on terrestrial ecosystems. And you'll hear about his work and the synthesis uh, he's recently led uh, in, in the talk today. So uh, welcome, Anthony, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Advinda. OK, let me try and get this up and running. I assume that's working OK. Um, yeah, thank you, Yadvinda. It's uh, it's great to be here today. It's it's uh, good to see you all online. Um, I hope everyone's doing very well, uh, and I hope that you know sometime in the future we can we can actually see each other face to face too. Um, spring is springing here in East Tennessee. Uh, it's looking good, and uh, I, I can't tell you how glad I am to see the back of that winter. It's uh, it's 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 uh, nice to look forward to a, to a brighter future. And uh, this, these, these seminars have been uh, a real lifeline to the outside world during the pandemic. I've, I've enjoyed them very much. I've enjoyed the, uh, the, the, the speakers, the, the quality of the talks, and just the diverse range of different talks in this seminar series. So um, thank you very much for, for organizing these seminars, Yadvinda. I've, I've appreciated them very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to, to come and speak to you today. Um, They've, they've been really high quality seminars, so I'll do my best to try and try and aim at that very high bar. Um, I want to talk to you today about some work that we've done um, integrating the various evidence themes for a terrestrial carbon sink caused by increasing atmospheric CO2. Uh, and and I'll, I'll say thank you to Yadvinder as well for, uh, for allowing me to go a bit beyond just the tropical biome in this, this presentation. And so this is this is based on a big review paper that we put together and, and has recently been published in New Phytologist. Uh, here's the full author list of that paper. And a little bit like this paper with this talk, I got kind of carried away and it's a bit of a beast. So um, apologies in advance for that. And I hope you can bear with me. Um, and so before I get really into the talk, I just want to uh, say thank you to everybody that was involved. This slide kind of captures everybody, pretty much everybody that was involved in this paper, but not quite everybody. Um, there were there were a number of admin staff that were really uh, influential in helping us out with with getting uh, a meeting organized, um, and and all the staff at New Phytologist for helping out getting the paper together and 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 their feedback, and of course the reviewers of the paper who took the time to to go over this beast and provide us constructive criticism and, and made the paper better in the end. So thanks to, thanks to all of you. And just an extra special thanks to these uh, folks who really put a lot of time and effort into this, into this synthesis, um, providing you know, drafting text and providing rapid feedback and, and drafting figures as well, some beautiful figures as you will see. And so just before I get into the meat of the talk, I just wanna start out with a little bit of a, of a warning that uh, if you guys are looking for answers, uh, I, I'll just say that there, there are limited answers ahead. There, there, are, there are dragons ahead in this understanding here. Um, although these waters, uh, to stretch the analogy, are very well charted in terms of understanding CO2 responses uh, at, at various scales, when we get to the global scale and understanding the CO2 response of the global terrestrial carbon sink, there are still quite a lot of uh, dragons of uncertainty that are lurking there. And so uh, there are limited answers, but we do have some answers. Uh, and um, uh, given that this is a Friday afternoon, I'll just uh, start laying out the, the few take home messages that I want you to, to take away from this talk. Um, so first up, a range of evidence supports a positive terrestrial carbon sink in response to increasing atmospheric CO2. And this is a highly valuable ecosystem service that's buying us time in the fight against climate change. 
but the, the, the strength of that sink, is the magnitude of it is uh, uncertain, the magnitude of that response to CO2, and there's a strong suggestion for additional agents of global change. I will say that all evidence types are biased in this, in this process. We found that basically all of the evidence that, that we brought together in one way or another is biased. And that's not to say that, you know, the, the, the studies were, were, were um, you know, poor or there wasn't a lot of time and effort involved in these studies. And, you know, all of these studies are, are excellent studies, um, but, but it's the nature of the job, the nature of ecology and the, the complexity and the, the sort of diversity of the systems and scales that we study, there are biases in all of these evidence types. And these biases are often acknowledged well in, in publications, but not always. Uh, and, and certainly when it comes to interpretation, you know, in terms of citation or in the media, uh, sometimes those biases are not, not sufficiently acknowledged. And I'll say, uh, hopefully I'll demonstrate that a quantitative combination of evidence with theory is helpful to, to um, sort of diagnose some of these biases and diagnose potential conflicts in, in the literature and whether some of the responses that we see empirically are consistent with what we expect from theory. Okay, and some, some background. Um, as you all know, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere have been increasing. They've increased from about 280 parts per million uh, pre-industry to, to about 410 parts per million uh, today. And this is the, the famous Keeling curve. Uh, from from um, for, uh, sorry, this is yeah a global a global analysis published in uh, Pierre Friedlinstein's recent paper for the Global Carbon Project, um, which is a which is a fantastic um, annual exercise to assess the the global carbon budget. So that increase in the atmosphere is an increase of about two hundred and eighty gigatons of carbon, uh, but total emissions uh, due to fossil fossil carbon burning and uh, net land use change emissions are about 660 gigatons of carbon. And so where does that carbon go? Um, this is, this is a, another figure from Pierre's paper that has been published in the Global Carbon Project papers uh, for, for some time now, originally published by uh, Pep Canadel and, and a lot of um, uh, publications by Corinne Lecare, who led this project before Pierre, uh, showing the emissions uh, uh, from both fossil fossil burning and from net land use change on the positive axis there, and then where that carbon ends up on the, on the negative space of that axis there, showing uh, that, that the emissions are partitioned roughly equally, more, more heavily biased towards the, the atmosphere, but also to the ocean and land sink. And so not all of those emissions are ending up in the atmosphere. And without those ocean and land sinks, we'd be at about 590 parts per million uh, CO2 in the atmosphere right now. Uh, so imagine, imagine without these uh, these ocean and land sinks, where we'd be with climate change right now. We'd be in a we'd be in a dire situation. And so this this is about um, understanding the causes of the natural land sink. Um, models indicate that CO2 is is a is a primary driver of this increasing land sink or this this land sink and uh, its increase over time. Uh, there's this CO2 fertilization hypothesis that, that all the models indicate. Uh, there's also the potential for nutrient deposition to increase this, this land sink in nutrient limited ecosystems. There's potential that warming or climate change could increase the land sink, but it could also have a negative effect on the land sink. And there's also the potential for unaccounted for land use change. Um, I, I had land use change, the net land use change source on this, on this figure, as well as the sort of natural land sink as it's described in in the Global Carbon Project papers. Uh, and you can see that they're roughly uh, balanced, this, this net land use change source and the natural land sink. And just to, just to indicate that, uh, yeah, models predict that really CO2 is the primary driver of that, of that natural land sink. This is a publication from Debbie Hunsinger of the Misty MIP project showing a, a range of model results there and partitioning the change in the terrestrial carbon sink. This is now showing a carbon sink on the positive axis here uh, and partitioning that to uh, these different hypotheses and basically showing that, that pretty much all the models predict that, that CO2 is the major driver of this um, natural land sink and the change in that land sink. And, uh, and they're decomposing those results shows that uh, tropical ecosystems are 
the major driver of that uh, that change. That's both due to a sort of a physiological interaction of CO2 and temperature, uh, but also I think, um, I'm not totally sure, but my understanding is that also just due to the, the, the vast land areas covered by forests in the tropical region. Uh, but our model predictive understanding of the terrestrial carbon response to CO2 is highly uncertain. This is showing the cumulative terrestrial carbon sink now uh, across a number of different models in response to CO2 uh, in green and then resp in response to CO2 and climate change in blue. Uh, and you can see that this is just a vast range of, um, of predicted CO2 responses here in uh, in in these, these studies. And that, that range of response has not improved over the past decade from CMIP5 to CMIP6. In fact, that range of model predictions of, of how they respond to increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, it has, got, has, uh, has increased a little bit. So our, our, our predictive understanding of these CO2 responses still leaves a lot to be desired. Second. Uh, and then if we compare that with our predictive understanding of the ocean sink, this is showing a much narrower range across those, those eight models. Sorry, that's a typo in the, in the, in the CMIP6 results there. Um, this range of eight models is much, much narrower. So that's where we'd like to be with, with our understanding for the terrestrial carbon sink in response to elevated CO2. Uh, but we're not there yet. And perhaps we'll, we might never get there just, just because these models are much more physical and chemical processes with the terrestrial land sink it's much more complex and there are a lot more biological and ecolog ecological processes that, that dominate uh, the reason for that terrestrial carbon sink and so uh, a bit of background on co2 effects on the terrestrial carbon sink or terrestrial carbon storage the direct effects of, the, of, of increasing CO2 on the carbon cycle are well known. We know that increasing atmospheric CO2 stimulates photosynthesis, increases gross primary production uh, at, at the leaf scale and canopy scales. Uh, and that um, also that, that additional carbon that, that allows plants to, to take up, uh, there's an exchange of carbon for water through the stomata and that increase in carbon allows uh, plants to use water a little more efficiently and often uh, stomatal conductance is, is reduced in response to elevated CO2. And I've highlighted this intrinsic water use efficiency response to CO2 because that's a really uh, well constrained response, almost more constrained than the, the stomatal conductance response uh, itself. And so the, the intrinsic water use efficiency response is highly, highly constrained and increases in response to, to elevated CO2. But those physiological fluxes are not uh, the terrestrial carbon sink or terrestrial carbon storage. Terrestrial carbon is stored in vegetation and soils. Uh, and the result of those, those sort of physiological responses to increasing atmospheric CO2 has to cascade through this system of, um, of ecological and biological responses. And so um, that increase in carbon has to um, flow through uh, carbon allocation and biomass production. Biomass production uh, increases the, the you know, increased biomass production increases the vegetation carbon. Uh, and then vegetation carbon turns over, goes into the soil, and then soil carbon is, is decomposed by soil microbes, uh, returning carbon back into the atmosphere or, or you know, leaving carbon in the soil as more recalcitrant carbon. And so we have this system of, of cascading um, responses that, that get further away from the, the, the direct physiological responses as you cascade through, the, through that system. Uh, and, and each one of those responses can feed back and influence other pieces of that system. And so when we look at the indirect responses, there's a lot more feedbacks and, and interactions there that, that make those fairly well understood and well constrained uh, physiological responses uh, much harder to predict how they cascade through to a change in terrestrial carbon storage. And actually, where that, that previous diagram was just a you know a nice abstraction of those different processes. When we try and dig into the the really how those processes work and interact and the complexity and the various scales, you can see that it's uh, that it's it's actually a much more 
complicated picture. And this, this beautiful diagram was put together by uh, Victor Leszek, uh, who's pictured here. He's a, he's a fantastic sci art illustrator, communicator of, of science in these sort of this visual medium. We were very lucky to have Victor involved in this project and to be able to, to, to really communicate some of that complexity in a very accessible way. Uh, and yeah, I, I enjoyed working with Victor very much. He, uh, he, he took, a, he took this, um, this PowerPoint horrendogram and turned it into this, this lovely figure here. And so all of this complexity and this, the, the, you know, the importance of the problem has led to a, a vast body of research. There's a, there's a huge number of papers out there on um, understanding the CO2 responses of, of various components of the ecosystem and the terrestrial carbon sink ultimately. Um, and a lot of this evidence can appear conflicting. You can find very, very often very different responses in the literature, depending on which particular evidence type you're looking at or which scale you're looking at. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very um, difficult literature to navigate as, as I've discovered upon sort of various travels and, and write up of, of, of discussions of previous papers. Uh, but it's, there's a huge and very interesting body of literature there from across a very wide range of evidence themes. And so there's lots of seemingly contradictory evidence, and we wanted to try and bring this evidence together under in, in some kind of synthesis. And so, as I said, there's lots of different evidence themes out there. We kind of categorized them into these four categories, uh, elevated CO2, which is uh, CO2 experiments and, and CO2 springs, tree growth, which is related, which um, evidence comes from forest inventories and tree ring data. There's ecosystem monitoring evidence, so flux towers at, at a kind of local scale and then uh, remote sensing at, at global and regional scales. And then we, uh, our final evidence theme was large scale constraints, which was sort of a catch all for, for other pieces such as atmospheric data from, from flask networks or stream gauges uh, from uh, ice cores and then stream gauges and, and other kind of uh, large scale constraints. And so these are our four evidence themes, and um, we, uh, yeah, the, the, the evidence across these different evidence themes can appear quite conflicting at times. And so what do we do about it? We decided to have a meeting, of course, that's what we do as scientists, right? We, uh, we, uh, we are people of action, we get together and uh, we decide to have a meeting. And, and um, we decided we wanted to have a meeting that, that brought together the community that represented people across these different evidence themes um, and that also had have differing of opinion, different differences of opinion in the literature. We really wanted this to be a synthetic community-based product. And so we, we deliberately invited people that, that have had discussions and, and you know, have different opinions in the literature. So we brought everybody together to, to start out with this, uh, this, this kind of community approach and this community synthesis. And so our goal was to attempt an integration of the major evidence themes within a process-based framework. So our four evidence themes within this simplified carbon cycle framework. And so just laying out our, our evidence themes here, we one important distinction that we made in the um, in the uh, in the paper was this distinction between increasing CO2 and elevated CO2, ICO2 or ECO2. And increasing CO2 uh, is, is what these various three evidence themes here um, are, are, are looking at. They're looking at the historical change in, um, in CO2 uh, over, over the historical period. And they're studying two different time points in that time series and comparing the change at the higher CO2 compared with the lower CO2. And of course that can vary, that can come for, uh, at any point in that time series for those different evidence themes. And then with elevated CO2, typically what we see are higher CO2 concentrations because the, the present day CO2 concentration is being modified in some way and increased. And so we have two concurrent um, CO2 treatments and so a common um, a common climatic background, whereas with the historical evidence, the ICO2 evidence, there's also concurrent um, 
change in other agents of global change. So climate, land use, um, nitrogen deposition, all of those additional agents of global change. And so we thought that was an important distinction to make. Uh, and our goal was a quantitative review to, to try and bring together these, these different threads of evidence in, in a common quantitative framework, but we weren't trying to, to go for a formal meta-analysis to really quantify these effects uh, directly. It was more we wanted to use the quantification to, to enable us to compa compare across you know, different CO2 concentrations and all these different variables. And so to do that, we needed to use a quantitative metric. And so we needed to standardize our different um, evidence types or different variables across different CO2 concentrations. And this is the metric that we opted for, this, this beta term, um, which you'll have heard about probably in, in the literature. There are a number of different beta terms out there. And we decided to opt for this particular beta, which is basically the ratio of the, the log transformed response ratios of both our variable, which is X at two different CO2 concentrations, uh, e being the higher CO2 concentration, A being the lower CO2 concentration, uh, and then um, normalized by the, the log transform response ratio of the CO2 change itself, because with increasing CO2 and with elevate, elevated CO2, they're at very different CO2 concentrations, uh, and um, we needed, they can be at very different CO2 concentrations, and the delta between the two different CO2 concentrations can be quite different as well. And so we wanted to try and standardize across all of those different um, CO2 concentrations and variable types. And so this is, this is a figure just showing um, why we chose our particular beta over some of the other ones that are commonly in the literature. And you can see this um, just a standard normalized, uh, standard um, idealized response to CO2 in this figure here um, on the left side, our response variable X showing a sublinear kind of monotonic response to CO2, which is fairly common, uh, and just showing a number of different response ratios or normalized response ratios and how they uh, calculate their, their sort of standardized metric in using this idealized response over different changes in CO2. So the green variables show you a change in CO2 of just five parts per million, uh, the green points, sorry, and then blue shows a delta of of 40 parts per million, black 100 and orange 200 parts per million. And this shows you um, how our various metrics um, uh, respond to those different changes according to this response here. And you can see the response ratio obviously is, is very variable across those different CO2 concentrations. And these different normalized uh, beta variables here um, show, uh, show a more sort of common response for a delta of CO2 uh, for variable delta CO2s, you can see um, this one shows uh, yeah, a fairly, fairly common response, but there is variability in this response here, uh, depending on the CO2 change. And the reason we opted for our, our beta was because there is, there is, um, it minimizes the variability in the calculated metric according to the different delta CO2 concentrations that you use there. And this, this, uh, this beta term is, is commonly used in the, in the literature, sort of uh, a response ratio normalized by uh, the, the, the change in CO2. So normalized to 100 parts per million change in CO2. And it, it's fairly similar to our metric, but there is a little bit more variability. But if we look at a, a, a linear response to CO2, which is important for water use efficiency, uh, so this is changing our idealized response to a linear CO2 response, you can see that normalized beta gives very different responses um, uh, depending on the delta CO2 that you look at, whereas the, the, the beta metric that we opted for gives you a consistent uh, delta of, uh, sorry, gives you a consistent metric of one across all of those different deltas. So this is why we opted for this, uh, this particular beta value, which isn't commonly used in the literature, but it is uh, related to previous values. And so this is, this is a figure of, of beta values across different evidence types. This is for GPP. We're going to revisit this in a bit, but I'm going to show you quite a lot of these figures. And so I just wanted to take you through these figures initially, uh, just, just to um, orientate you to them. And so 
for our increasing CO2, uh, they're, they're plotted in these blue points here. So this is increasing CO2. So this is a response observed over the historical period, but also concurrently with all of those different um, agents of global change. And then these green points here are, are the same. They're, they're um, responses to increasing CO2 over the historical period, but where uh, a study has tried to attribute that change solely, as the, the piece of that change that is CO2 is solely responsible for. So this is an attribution response to CO2. And then these purple points below here are, um, are responses to elevated CO2. So a response to a manipulation of CO2, um, generally from elevated CO2 experiments, but also from a natural manipulation caused by geological springs. And so that's the three different categories of CO2 response that we have on this figure. And then um, uh, no response is a zero, zero line here. And then uh, a response of one is that proportional linear response that I showed you on that previous figure. So this is, um, this is indicating that proportional linear response to CO2, uh, the dashed line here. And then this, uh, this panel underneath here showing these uh, probability density functions are just a combination of the points above using just a, a simple assumption of normality uh, and just combining those, those different distributions that you see there uh, using a, a very simple assumption that they're, they're all equally weighted and equally contribute to these, um, these distributions here. And so, and the confidence intervals that you see on these are our confidence interval that we calculated uh, in the paper. We tried to calculate everything with confidence intervals where we could. Um, and these are a 95% confidence interval. And so for the, for the analysis, uh, for the study, we came up with a number of confidence statements. This was in response to uh, one of the original review comments, which was uh, that the synthesis seemed a little um, uh, cherry picking and, and potentially opinionated, which is, which is fair enough. It was had some of my opinion in it. Uh, so we wanted to create something that was more community-based and was more uh, kind of rigorous in its approach. So we came up with these confidence statements, which we kind of borrowed the structure for those from, or the structure for developing those from the IPCC assessment report. We, we you know, it wasn't anywhere near as rigorous and as, as, as um, you know, time-consuming as the IPCC report, but, but we did borrow a little bit from their review process where uh, we came up with these confidence statements and everyone had the opportunity to comment on these confidence statements, vote on them, uh, and explain why they thought the, the confidence statement was good or not. Uh, and then that those all went into an Excel table. And then um, I responded, I, I went through each of those comments, responded to them, um, and made modifications. Or in the case where I didn't make modifications, I explained why. And that went back to the, to, the, to the various people who'd made the comments and they had a chance to comment again. And so that was the idea was trying to produce this kind of community agreement for these confidence statements. And we tried to, to categorize them into this fairly simple um, high, medium and low categorizations where um, all estimates agree in, but in either the, you know, and we made these confidence statements in terms of either the sign of the change or the magnitude of the change. And so high meant that all estimates agree. Medium meant that the estimate means kind of disagreed, but there was substantial overlap in confidence intervals. And then low meant that the, the estimate means disagreed and that there was little overlap in confidence intervals, broadly speaking. And so starting out with, um, with the direct CO2 effects on, on plant physiology gross primary production to start out with. So this is, this is some theory that we, that we uh, did. We ran, we ran a model with some variability to get a canopy scale predicted response of GPP to CO2. We uh, produced some of the variability by varying some key traits like VC max and the, the ratio of J max to, to VC max to produce this variability in this curve here. And just showing you some vertical lines at pre-industrial CO2 concentrations present day CO2 concentrations and then CO2 concentrations predicted for some time in the future. And just showing this is kind of the historical change and this is the, the somewhat predicted future change. And then we use these simulations to calculate a kind of theoretical beta value 
from, from what we understand from leaf level and canopy scaling theory. And this is what we get. We actually added a little bit more variability just to see what kind of range of beta we can get from our understanding of theory. We added some environmental variation, temperature variation, relative humidity and, and light variation. And what you can see here generally is that, that that predicted future response, this purple PDF here is generally lower than the than the um, than the, the historical response. That's what we expect from this kind of saturating relationship here. Uh, and this modality in these responses is uh, in response to, to relative humidity. And just to say this is this was just an, uh, an exploration of theory, really. It wasn't an attempt to to quantify exactly kind of a global beta or, or a standard beta, but it's just to look at the kind of variability that we might expect across these different CO2 concentrations. And so, yeah, this is just, uh, just what I just said as a, as a caveat. And we didn't consider optimization theories where, um, where, where leaf physiology um, adapts to, to the environmental conditions of the time, partly because, um, uh, partly because Sometimes uh, with these optimization theories, you can see an increase in response to elevated CO2, but you can also see a decrease in the response in terms of a, in response to elevated CO2. So there was not 100% common agreement, but, but that was definitely a way that would be interesting to explore in the future. And so coming back to this figure, um, we had high confidence that, that terrestrial GPP has increased concurrently with uh, the historical change in CO2. These various points here all come from a range of different method, methods. And uh, they are, a lot of them are global scale. Some of them come from ice core atmospheric measurements, combining those with, with um, combining measurements of COS, um, sorry, carbonyl sulfide and uh, um, isotopic measurements, combining those with models to get an inference of global GPP. Uh, isotopolog anal analysis from various archive plant matter also combined with a model. There are global satellite products. They're also combined with a model. So uh, you may, the, one of the points that I want to make here is that a lot of these observations are also up, combined with models, um, which, which may or may not have some kind of implicit CO2 response in, embedded in those models. Uh, but overall, there's, there's these, this evidence suggests that GPP has increased over the historical period. Uh, and medium confidence in the magnitude. You can see there's quite some variability in those different mean values there, um, but the confidence intervals tend to overlap uh, to some degree. Uh, and again, the, yeah, these, these, same, these same measurements. Um, and yeah, the, the, the measurements from the flux tower there, the Fernandez-Martinez measurements tend to be somewhat higher than the, the other uh, estimates of, of global change, um, of GPP response to, to global change, uh, potentially because of relatively short time series and um, um, relatively few sites with long enough time series to analyze this, this change in response to GPP. And um, so moving on to experiments, we had a high confidence that ecosystem scale experimentally elevated CO2 increases diurnal photosynthesis in leaves. Um, this comes from a meta-analysis, uh, a still uh, very relevant and excellent meta-analysis from Lisa Ainsworth and Steve Long from, from, of face experiments from back in 2005. And you can see that actually that, um, that response observed there with gas exchange measurements uh, on diurnal photosynthesis in these uh, in these face experiments um, is is fairly similar to what we would expect from theory. They're at the upper end of that historical beta response that we would expect, um, but they are consistent with theory. Whereas the um, the observations across uh, the historical period are much higher than we would expect from theory. They're they're closer to one a proportional response, which is which is not what we would expect from theory. So either there are some feedbacks at, at, at the ecosystem scale or larger in response to CO2, or there are other agents of global change at play there. Uh, and yeah, that's more or less what I just said, that the GPP increase was primarily driven by increasing CO2 and potentially that CO2 was not the sole driving factor for that. Um, yeah the comparison of those, those sort of PDFs there. And so moving on to water use efficiency, this is the same set of simulations that I showed you before for GPP from a canopy scale 
photosynthesis model. And this is showing the response with its uncertainty of in instantaneous water use efficiency, which is GPP over stomatal conductance, in this case, canopy conductance. And just showing you that that's a very constrained response there. This is, this is, um, this is the theoretical prediction for canopy scale, instantaneous water use efficiency responses to elevated CO2. Uh, and this is why I said that, that you know, this is really a very, uh, at least theoretically constrained response to elevated CO2. And this is showing you the beta value again, calculated for that water use efficiency response. These are just over one. I will say that I, I made a, a slight mistake in these calculations. There was a, uh, a miscommunication as we were rapidly trying to, to produce these figures in the interim between our review comments and, and getting the responses back. Um, but it is an interesting mistake. I'm not going to go into it in much detail, but it might, might, it might be one of those mistakes that actually shines a light on, on some, some new understanding, potentially. Anyway, the, the theoretical response from Medlin's stomatal conductance model and others should fall on that, uh, that, um, that, one, that one beta response line there and be very constrained on that line. But overall, the, with the response with this model, they're very constrained and just slightly higher than one. And then this is the response of stomatal conductance is a, a fairly consistent decrease uh, in response to elevated CO2. Um, that's the combination of this instantaneous water use efficiency response and the GPP response. And so looking at our, our various evidence types, uh, we've got a lot of evidence here from um, atmospheric measurements and Delta 13 C that run through a through an instantaneous water use efficiency model. We have a lot of tree ring isotopic data, again, run through, a, through a, an instantaneous water use efficiency model. Um, but, but all of these data suggest that we have high confidence that increasing CO2 has increased instantaneous water use efficiency uh, and fairly medium confidence that the magnitude is in accordance with theory. You can see they're kind of clustered around that beta value of one there, which is what our theory tells us to expect. There is some variability there, actually fairly substantial variability. These axes are quite a wide range for this beta value now because of these, these high values uh, from, um, from, from flux tower measurements uh, that, have, that are much higher. So there is quite a substantial variability, but in general, they all cluster around that beta value of one. And these measurements from, from eddy covariance, this is uh, a study that Trevor Keenan published uh, uh, some years ago now um, show a very high response of um, ecosystem scale, what they call inherent water use efficiency, which is ecosystem scale GPP over evapotranspiration is, is substantially higher than, than, than observed elsewhere and, and substantially higher than we would expect from theory. And a, a reanalysis of those data with a little more data um, reduced that response somewhat, um, but not, uh, not, not sufficiently to bring it back into line. But there are a number of theories for why that is, um, some of those being potentially a short time series, but also some mechanistic theory as well. And so moving on to CO2 effects on um, biomass production. This is this sort of central part of the figure here where um, we have additional carbon from GPP. And what does a plant do with that? How does that get allocated? How does that get transferred to leaves, wood, fine roots or uh, other components of, of um, uh, net primary production. And so the theory for, for uh, our effects on CO2 and biomass production, uh, it's a little more complex now. This is a nice figure from Simone Fatici's paper in New Phytologist also, um, showing just the interaction of, of uh, various environmental drivers there on carbon assimilation, that, that additional source uh, and how that interacts with, with sink processes uh, to, to result in increased biomass production. And so that's, that's, a, that's a more complicated, um, more complex theory that we have there, uh, less quantitative, uh, but a lot of models assume this kind of source push for biomass production. If there's more carbon available, then plants will grow more. But Simone was trying to illustrate here that, that, that there is more to it than that. Uh, and a number of more recent models try and represent some of that sink limitation by nutrients and, and other factors. Uh, and just to say this gross primary production is, is, um, is typically thought of as a net primary production plus respiration. 
And we, we use the term biomass production instead of net primary production because biomass production is actually the production of biomass uh, plus some other things like use of carbon for symbionts, passing off to symbionts or root exudation or loss of uh, volatile organic chemicals from, from the leaves. And so all of those are a part of the MPP component, but generally what's measured is, uh, is biomass production of one sort or another. So this is why we opted to use this term biomass production. Uh, and so a first order assumption would be that the beta response of biomass production uh, should roughly be the same as the GPP response. This is just a simple first order uh, assumption for, for our theoretical prediction for, for a biomass production response. In reality, due to these sink limitations, in particular nutrient limitations, we would expect that beta response to be lower than our, our GPP response. And so moving on to, to some, what does the evidence say? Um, we have medium confidence uh, of an increase in wood biomass production over the historical period with low confidence in the magnitude, um, given, given such a range of, of responses there. These data are primarily from, from forest inventory analyses, some really nice papers from, from the rainfall network that, that Yad Vinder is strongly involved in, um, some nice papers from, from Rul Brienen and Juan Hubao, Simon Lewis, um, and a number of other ones there showing a range of, of CO2 responses, um, some as high as, oh, sorry, a range of responses that are concurrent with a change in CO2, some of them as high as that, that beta value of one, which is quite substantially higher than our theoretical prediction. And then, uh, so yeah, a couple of these are from tree ring analyses, um, very wide range of, of, of responses in tree ring analyses to CO2, both positive uh, and um, so either neutral or negative. And uh, there, are some, there are some really strong biases in inferring trends uh, from tree rings that, that Rob Riennan and a number of others have, have pointed out. So we tend to place more confidence in the forest inventory methods, which are not uh, devoid of biases themselves, but we tended to, in, our, in the paper, we tended to place a little more confidence in the forest inventory analysis measurements. Um, just because, um, yeah, some of the tree ring estimates can, the, the trends uh, can, be, can be biased by as much as 200%. So, um, yeah, that's quite a strong bias in your potential trend. And even correcting by that much, you're correcting by more than your, your, your sort of inferred trend. So um, there's a lot of potential uncertainties in those data. And then uh, we have high confidence that elevated CO2 can stimulate biomass production from, from elevated CO2 experiments and um, from, from some CO2 springs. Uh, this is a range of, of, of evidence here uh, that we selected from a number of different face experiments and meta-analyses of face experiments, just showing a range, but, but just showing there that, that um, elevated CO2 can stimulate biomass production uh, up to about a maximum of, of 0.5, a beta of 0.5 that we see here. Um, we're also confident that this response is diminished by nutrient limitations, but there's only limited evidence uh, from a number of sites for, for progressive nitrogen limitation, uh, which is something that I haven't gone into, but it's a common theory for, for, for biomass responses to, to elevated CO2 to be progressively limited by nitrogen. Uh, but we only see that at a number of, a couple of sites uh, and uh, interestingly, in those sites that um, nitrogen was progressively limiting production, both in the ambient treatment there, as well as the elevated treatment. Uh, yeah, and we have one uh, geological spring basal area increment measurement in this analysis as well, showing an increase. Okay, and so in the paper, we said there was high confidence that uh, the observed forest inventory response is likely due to CO2 and additional factors, just because they're, they're hitting this beta value of around one in many cases, which, we, which is quite a bit higher than we would expect from theory, especially given nutrient limitations and potential nutrient limitations in, in these forests. But I will say that I crossed that out for, the, for, this, uh, for this talk and, and put medium confidence um, just because um, I think there are, there are potentials for, for elevated CO2 experiments to, to uh, over-represent the limitations to CO2 responses. That big step change in CO2 can really 
bump the system with carbon. So we would expect the nitrogen cycle to be, um, to be particularly limiting in, in those experiments. Um, but that said, I still think these values are, are pretty high compared to what we would expect from theory um, as, a, as a biomass response to elevated CO2 or to increasing CO2. And so moving on to CO2 effects on, on plant mortality, which is, which is a key component of, of um, stocks, uh, carbon stocks in an ecosystem. And so the, the theory gets a little bit more hand wavy here and a little bit more empirical. Um, the growth survival trade-off is, is a well-established um, trade-off in terms of increasing growth, increasing mortality, but we don't know how CO2 affects that, that growth survival trade-off. Uh, there's large size related mortality could expect to be increased as uh, if growth is stimulated, but also if growth is stimulated, small size related mortality could be reduced. Uh, and under elevated CO2, there could be more carbon available for defensive compounds, potentially um, aiding trees in, in combating their enemies and, and slowing mortality rates. Uh, so lots of possible effects there. And so what do we see? Uh, there's, from a number of studies, there's high confidence that tree mortality has increased over the historical period, uh, but low confidence in the magnitude. Um, obviously, there's a lot, of, a lot of different responses depending on what part of the the world, these, these responses are observed. And a lot of these responses, the ones with, with particularly high apparent beta values over the historical period, values up to about six, uh, are thought to be due to warming or VPD um, increases over, over that, that time period. But there are a number of other studies that, that assume that CO2 is, is a major driver of that uh, observed increase in mortality. And um, they are, yeah, they, a lot of these studies attribute this change to CO2 and those, those changes, um, as you can see from this figure here, are, are pretty high in terms of that theoretical beta value. They're, 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 they're ranging from about one and a half to, to three, which is, um, you know, given what we know about biomass production and other responses to elevated CO2, these are, these are very high uh, beta values. So um, my guess would be that that these responses are not solely due to CO2, um, if at all. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, the, the, this is um, kind of what I was just saying, I suppose that the response of mortality to increased CO2 and elevated CO2 is unknown, even in direction of change is unclear. Uh, there's very limited evidence from elevated CO2 studies. Um, there is some evidence from the Rhinelander face that, that elevated CO2 relaxes self-thinning constraints um, and, and sort of reduces self-thinning to some degree. But, but it's only over a short time period relative to forest tree lifespans, and it could just be a, a temporary relaxation of that self-thinning constraint. And so moving on to... Um, uh, CO2 effects on organic matter decomposition. This is the loss of organic matter from soils. Um, indirect CO2 effects on soil organic matter decomposition rates. Um, the, the theory of that, again, is, is, um, is somewhat nebulous. There's both positive and negative possible effects. Uh, priming increases is a, is a, is a big uh, theoretical assumption with elevated CO2 here that, that increased carbon could allow plants to stimulate decomposition through symbiotic and associated microbial um, associations. Uh, which, which, yeah, which could increase decomposition rates, but then um, there's also the potential for reduced litter quality, increasing carbon to nitrogen ratios uh, due to nitrogen limitation and higher carbon availability, slowing decomposition, which is related to the progressive nitrogen limitation hypothesis I mentioned earlier. And so, um, looking at looking at some of the evidence, we have uh, low confidence that. Uh, that soil organic matter decomposition has increased over the historical period. There's, there's fairly few studies of this. Um, there's, there's some nice studies by Ben Bond Lamberty and again, Fernandez Martinez bringing together flux tower measurements and Ben Bond Lamberty bringing together um, respiration chamber measurements from across the world. And both of those show an increase uh, in, in respiration over the historical period. Uh, but it's, it's unknown whether SOM decomposition rates have increased um, over this time period. These show an increase in respiration, but if, if soil carbon is increased, uh, 
we might expect to see an increase in respiration, uh, even if decomposition rates did not increase. So we're not sure about the decomposition rates here. And this is a this the the, the data that we decided to show on this figure is 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 somewhat loose. It's not all decomposition rates because there was there was limited data out there on on solely on decomposition rates. So we brought together a number of different variables in in this figure just to get an idea of how uh, decomposition is changing over time. Um, there's medium confidence that, that increasing CO2 increases rates of SOM decomposition. Um, just looking at these figures there, there's an, a number of different responses observed over a number of different scales. Uh, Van Groningen meta-analysis is, is a nice one demonstrating an increase in, in decomposition rates. Um, but again, this is, this is mainly from pot studies uh, and there is, there is some evidence for increasing decomposition rates uh, from face experiments out in the field. Um, but there's also evidence that the decomposition rates have not increased. And so finally putting this all together in, into the context of the CO2 effects on um, terrestrial ecosystem carbon. Um, we have high confidence that terrestrial ecosystem carbon has increased over the historical period in places. I'm going to add that, that emphasis there. We didn't put that in the paper, but in places because the natural carbon sink is almost balanced by the net land use change source. And so uh, terrestrial ecosystem carbon, according to the carbon budget, is, um, has, has been fairly stable over the historical period, although there's been a lot of uh, gross fluxes, both positive and, and negative. Um, but nevertheless, the natural carbon sink, the natural carbon sink suggests an increase um, from the global carbon budget, um, the, the nice global synthesis of, of forest inventory data from, from Udi Pan suggests that, that forests have increased their carbon globally. Uh, and then uh, some evidence from elevated CO2 experiments, just a, just a, a, a sample for some, from some very different sites for the, for the elevated CO2 um, studies, but just showing that there is a range of responses there and the reason why we picked these two is because they have done a, a full ecosystem scale carbon budget for these face experiments. Uh, a number of others um, we didn't show on this figure. Um, and so moving on to, to looking at um, ecosystem carbon and vegetation carbon and soil carbon, there's medium confidence that elevated CO2 increases ecosystem carbon stocks over the short to medium time scales. Um, but with low confidence in the magnitude, there's quite a bit of variability across those different elevated CO2 experiments. Uh, and then there's medium confidence as well that increasing CO2 has contributed to the change over the historical period. Uh, but again, low confidence in that magnitude. You can see generally there's a lot of variability in those responses over the historical period. Uh, and, and in general, they tend to be higher than the responses we see from elevated CO2 experiments. And so in summary, um, there's a, again, as I said right at the beginning, there's a range of evidence supporting a positive terrestrial carbon sink in response to increasing CO2. But the magnitude is uncertain and there's a strong suggestion in my opinion uh, for a role for additional agents of global change. Um, evidence suggests a substantial increase in global GPP. Uh, theory and experiments indicate that potentially about half of this is due to increasing CO2. It would be good to nail that down further. Uh, plant mortality and soil carbon responses to increasing CO2 are highly uncertain. And in the case of soil carbon, um, it, you'd be hard pressed to find any study that actually looks at um, a sort of long-term historical trend in soil carbon in, in natural ecosystems. There are some in terms of of agricultural ecosystems and the losses of soil carbon from those, but, but not looking at how soil carbon has changed over the historical period in more natural ecosystems. Again, all evidence types are biased and it's very worth acknowledging those biases and understanding them to interpret our, our findings. Uh, and then hopefully I've shown that combining evidence with theory can help to avoid unlikely attributions to CO2 or at least put those in the context of theoretical expectations can help to identify and acknowledge some of these biases and, and hopefully can reduce some of the seeming contradictions in the literature. So we have a number of recommendations for future research. Um, I'm not gonna read every single one of these out, uh, but they're in the paper and I'd be very happy to share these slides if anyone's interested. Uh, one thing I want to highlight is that I think integrated studies like this that, that consider a number of different evidence types 
and put those in the context of the theory that we might expect uh, will help us to, to, to go forward and provide the best information to, um, to stakeholders and policymakers about the, the influence of elevated CO2 and increasing CO2 on the terrestrial carbon sink. And so the final word is that uh, the terrestrial carbon sink is a major ecosystem service that has substantially slowed the pace of climate change. We think CO2 is a major driver of that response, but we cannot quantify that effect uh, with, with any uh, certainty. And I think there's, there's a lot of potential in that area to, to further understand the interaction between the natural land sink and the net, net land use change source. And there's some new interesting papers in the pipeline that, that are looking at that. And so I just want to say thank you, uh, finally, to all of you guys for listening. Thank you again to Yadvinda for, for inviting me to speak. And uh, thank you to our sponsors who uh, have helped um, make this happen, or this wouldn't be possible without their support. Hey, thank, thank you, Anthony. Uh, and if you stop sharing that, we can uh, open up to, to, to the audience. Uh, thanks, that was a, a masterclass in just working your way through you know, what's a complex and kind of contradictory literature. And, and as somebody who was involved in a small way in the paper as well, I think uh, it, it's a real model for how you can really get a community with lots of divergence, streams of evidence, divergent conclusions from that evidence, divergent theoretical frameworks, and try and get them to, to come together to some sort of synthesis. So congratulations on, on leading both and giving this talk, but also leading such a complicated an ambitious effort. Uh, okay, we can open up to questions now. Uh, and uh, firstly, I'd encourage the audience again to switch on your cameras. It's, it's nice to have a, a face, faces in the audience, uh, rather than names where possible. No obligation, of course, but if you'd like to switch on your camera, yeah, you're more than welcome to. It's, it's nice to, nice to have, have faces in the audience. Uh, so I'd like to open it up, uh, up to questions. You can pop your uh, uh, questions in the chat box and I'll invite you to unmute and directly ask the question. If for any reason you prefer not to unmute or you can't because your microphone's not working, uh, just let me know and I can channel those questions to uh, uh, Anthony. Uh, so I'll just kick off while we're waiting for a few questions to, to pop in. Uh, in the end, you had a slide of all of these uh, research priorities that, that you'd focus on to move forward. If you could pick one of those, if you were starting a big NSF research program to tackle the carbon sink. And there was one particular priority that you think would has a chance of giving the greatest chance of reducing uncertainty uh, in, in the biosphere CO2 fertilization one, which, which one do you think that should be? Uh, I would go, it's a great question. I, I would go, I think for, this is maybe just the way that my own interests are leading me at, at, at currently, but I think I would go for a, a, an attempt a global attempt to, to integrate these various evidence types, specifically looking at, um, at that the way that that net land use change source is calculated and the terrestrial carbon sink is calculated and trying to bring those together into a, into a consistent framework um, that, that draws upon all of these different evidence types and tries to put them together in, in, um, in some kind of quantitative model data assimilation kind of kind of um, study that's 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 the next step but that's where I would like to go next okay great okay so I'll turn over to uh, some of the, the questions in the chat uh, so Nia you have a question would you like to ask it directly Neil that's Niels I think is it yeah is it... Niels are you there If not, I'll channel that. Uh, you mentioned that uh, progressive nitrogen limitation was only observed in a few studies. And in those cases, it was also found in the ambient CO2 treatment. Which studies were these? And could you elaborate uh, a bit on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so so from, from my understanding, there is that this, so I wanna, let me start this and say clear that, that um, that's not to say that nutrients don't limit the response of biomass production to, um, to elevated CO2. I think there's a huge amount of evidence that suggests that nutrients do limit the response to elevated CO2 of biomass production. But this theory of progressive nitrogen limitation, whereby you get um, 
an early response and then a decrease in that response as nitrogen becomes progressively more limiting through the course of elevated CO2 enrichment is only has only been really observed uh, in my understanding or my understanding of the literature uh, at uh, the Oak Ridge face experiment and um, I forget I forget there's another there's another um, quite famous paper on progressive nitrogen limitation it might be from Biocon the face experiment but I think it's a grassland face experiment but if you look at both of the the trajectories in both of those studies in the ambient treatment um, there is there is a declining response. Uh, sorry, there is a declining biomass production um, trend in the ambient treatments. Um, and yeah, just just to um, to focus on the Oak Ridge face experiment, which I'm more familiar with. There's there's this um, there's this increase in biomass production. You hit this kind of peak somewhere in the middle of the face experiment, uh, and then and then the biomass production tails off towards the end of that experiment. And that's in the ambient treatment. And really the, the elevated CO2 response mimics that trajectory. It's just towards the end of that trajectory that the CO2 response decline is just a bit sharper than in the ambient treatment. So that by the end of the treatment, by the end of the experiment, you see no response to elevated CO2. Um, uh, and so that's, so you've both got this, you've got this progressive nitrogen limitation caused we think by stand development uh, and you know sequestration of nitrogen in the soil uh, and potentially in the woody biomass of that system and then overlaid on that you've got this this boost of co2 which increases production for a little while but but it's following this trajectory of nitrogen limit progressive nitrogen limitation and the co2 treatment exacerbates that progressive nitrogen limitation hopefully that please thank you Okay, uh, Zheng Shi, you have a question? Yes, hi, hi Anthony. Hi. Thank you very, very much for such a great talk. Uh, my quick question is, have you considered the line of evidence from you know, the emergent constraint of uh, you know, a continental CO2 fertilization effect? You know, like from uh, Peter Cox group, like you have the observation from the atmospheric CO2 read change and yeah. which can, yeah yeah we so um we we did consider that we philippe ca was involved in that uh, activity i believe that the the co2 fertilization one specifically um we we maybe i made a decision to to not get into the world of um terrestrial ecosystem models too deeply in this in this um this this particular evidence synthesis um the reason for that was it would just it this is already a monster and it would have just opened up another can of worms and so i i and i the idea was that i really wanted to focus in on the evidence types that we have rather than looking at models which are making predictions based on our uh, our theory and so in this in this particular study we we used just a simple canopy scale ecosystem model to look at what we would expect from theory at that, at that kind of canopy scale, rather than looking at what we would expect from our hypotheses and our theory uh, from these global scale models. I think um, that's not to say all of that evidence is not important. I think it really is. It was just trying to limit the boundaries of this, this study, which was already um, substantial. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Helene, you've got a couple of questions there. Do you want to pop them? Hi, yes, uh, Anthony, great, great analysis. Great to see all that put together. And I totally agree that looking at multiple lines of evidence is a really powerful approach. I'm kind of surprised that, the, that you didn't have find more studies looking at the possibility of CO2 fertilization using temperate forest inventory data. You know, the US and, U and Europe have such huge forest inventory data sets. And I'm aware of at least one study, Kasperson, Bacala et al, 2000 in science, that, that analyzed those and concluded there was at most a very small um, CO2 fertilization effect or effect of any kind of change over time. But the only temperate kind of forest study you included was you et al, which is you know just 685 plots, most of them tropical, not going back very far in time. So isn't there more of a temperate literature that could be brought to bear on the question of woody productivity changes over time? Uh, yeah, yeah, there are. Um... 
Uh, first of all, hi, Helena. How are you doing? Nice to see you. <laughs> Uh, thanks for that. Um, the, um, we we did we did actually bring a couple more of those studies in. We maybe I didn't show them all on these figures, but in the in the in the review we do look at those some more studies. We we do talk about the Casperson study. The reason we didn't put Casperson um, on that on that figure is because they basically just look at two time points. I think you know it, it was. I think they're using FIA, FIA data, if I remember rightly, and they're only really yeah, looking at two yeah. time points. And so, the, the, you know, it's quite difficult to make an inference on a trend from, from two time points, right? And so it was an important paper at the time, but there was a lot of criticism that followed up that paper. Um, and uh, so we- And no one's to... done a better job in the 20 years since? I mean, the paper has been cited over 600 times. The um, the U paper actually does have a lot of temperate data sets in it. Uh, the, it's not just tropical. There is there is temperate data and a number of other data sets. So that's we kind of went for presenting the U uh, the results from the U paper over the results from the Casperson paper because they do include temperate uh, temperate data. In we in the in the figure we just use their global result, but in in the paper, we go into their more uh, regionally disaggregated data sets too. We also looked uh, at a study from um, Prech, I'm probably not pronouncing that right at all, that looks at an interesting, uh, really nice forest inventory data set from, from Germany, I think, that has, um, a, 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 the, it's a forest inventory data set as well as a kind of chrono sequence, I believe. But they've got some really nice, nice evidence there. Um, I forget exactly what those findings were off the top of my head in terms of, of, of quantifying those results. Uh, and we also looked at uh, Sean McMahon's paper, which shows, um, which looked at Eastern deciduous forest plots that are part of the, the Smithsonian network, I think, or maybe they're, maybe they're not, maybe they're, maybe they're from a different network, but we looked at those and Sean's conclusion was that there's a very substantial CO2 response. But actually, if you translate that into a beta value, and I think that was on one of the figures, if you translate that response to a beta value, it's about a beta of about 2.5, which is you know really Too much high. higher than we would expect. Yeah. So we do, we do, we do use, we didn't just focus on, on tropical forest um, inventory analyses in, in the paper. We did look at others. Okay, I'll take a closer look. I was just looking at the table and the only temperate biomass production one that's mentioned is you and all. Um, but uh, that that yeah. might be that might be because the way that we categorized it as biomass production, we were looking at biomass production with you. I think they tried to look at biomass production. The other ones might be in the vegetation carbon response. OK, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Thanks. Just to follow up on that, we say one of the big challenges with temperate forest inventories in particular is that they're most them tend to be successful by the post disturbance, uh, post anthropogenic disturbance. And yeah. in those studies, and how do you try and factor that, that into your analysis of, of uh, beta factors? Or do you just try and focus on the oldest, most mature stands? Um, we, uh, we didn't really take that into account. You know, the, the beta factor was, a, was, was calculated from, from whatever response they show in those particular studies. But it's a good point that they, you know, these, these systems are aggrading or developing, maturing however you want to phrase it, a lot of the time in, in these temperate ecosystems and, um, um, you know, the beta value calculated on those systems is, a, is an apparent beta, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's an attempt to sort of quantify that response so that we can compare it with our theory and with other, other systems, but it's, it's not a, a definite beta of a CO2 response. And so, but, but some of those studies you know, they, they infer that a lot of that change is due to CO2. And so calculating the beta helps you to realize that, okay, that's, if you're inferring that a beta value of three is all due to CO2, you, it's probably unlikely. And there's probably other factors um, at play there. And, um, you know, the system of grading, um, recovering from land use change may be one of those factors. Great. Okay, uh, Wasim, you have a question. Uh, great talk. Um, I'm not sure if my question is still relevant, but um, I realized that in the middle of one of your answers, you mentioned that you were doing Kimby scale, but I was wondering whether could you somehow factor in regional analysis or see differences between region? Would that give you a better indication of the sinks in 
uh, for example, the southern versus the northern hemisphere, and and so on. Yeah, I, yeah, I uh, I think there's definitely a lot of power in regional analysis. That the, the canopy scale analysis that we did was was a was a was a, a modeling analysis. There are some canopy scale data that we have in the paper as well, but the canopy scale work that we did was 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 for the model. We had this sort of canopy scale model that we ran to get our theoretical beta predictions for the canopy scale. We didn't want to go, or you know, maybe I didn't want to go beyond that because as you say, when you get into the regional, and now when you get into the regions, there's a lot of different other factors that, that are at play there. There's, you know, there's um, different land use change histories, there's different nutrient availabilities, um, different proportions of forests versus grasses versus C3 grasses versus C4 grasses. And so we didn't, we didn't look too closely in terms of the model at, at, at a larger scale than canopy, but but in terms of the data that we, we brought in, and I didn't really talk too much about this, but the, the data are from a number of different scales, ranging from leaf scale to sort of tree scale to plot scale to regional to, to global scales. Um, and we, we, didn't, we didn't, although scale is, is really important here, we didn't really feel that we had enough data to really um, understand how scale influences those different, those different beta values. So. I'm not sure that answers your question, but hopefully. Yeah. It Thank you. I realized before that um, you were doing canopy scale. I'm all new to this, so <laughs> cheers. Thanks. Sure. Great. If anybody has any more questions, either feel free to just raise your hand or just pop your question now. There's nothing more in the chat. Uh, uh, Sophia? Um, I'm curious how this analysis, especially the fact that you see netting out of um, land use emissions from kind of the increase in, in the land use um, sink, or at least, you know, it's netting out, how this research has affected your stance on the role of uh, quote unquote nature-based solutions in the offsetting space? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> And it's something that's a little bit outside of my comfort zone, but um, I, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of potential there for nature-based solutions. Given, yeah, like, as you said, basically the 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 net land use change and the terrestrial carbon sink kind of cancel each other out. If you look at gross land use change emissions, they're 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 substantially higher than the, the net land use change emission. Um, so there's potential for 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 regrowing forests there. Um, there's potential for putting carbon into the soil. Um, that's a that's a nature-based solution that I hear talked about a lot, but um, we really don't understand well the processes of of um, soil carbon formation versus soil carbon decomposition. Uh, I think there's a lot more understanding there that that we need before we can really rely on on putting carbon in the soil um, uh, for. Uh, for for you know this nature based solution to to mitigation of climate change, um, I think you know potentially there's a lot of potential should we reforest the planet. But if we reforest the planet, where are we going to grow our food? So I, I think there is potential in those nature based solutions for for more forest growth. Um, but but um, it's uh, it is it is limited in its scope compared to what how much carbon we've lost from the land surface. Um, I will say that uh, that you know these nature-based solutions are, are are great and they're part of the solution. But you know really what we need to do is is draw fossil fuel emissions down to zero. I'll just pitch in a little bit extra there. Uh, we had a paper a couple of years ago by Sean Maxwell in in Science Advances where we looked at the value of intact forests and currently say in red or other carbon assessments intact forests are valued for the carbon store but if they carry on being a carbon sink as they seem to be at the moment uh, and because of ongoing co2 fertilization we show in that paper that, that there's a substantial additional carbon value that isn't accounted for simply by looking at the carbon stock there's all the if you chop down that forest it isn't just the carbon stock you lose it's the foregone carbon sink for the next few decades in the future, that's also lost and that adds a lot of extra value. Uh, the problem, of course, is we don't know the future with certainty. We don't know if the CO2 carb uh, sink will persist. 
under climate change or the CO2 saturation, all those factors. So this sort of understanding that Anthony's trying to piece together here through uh, about mechanisms of the carbon of CO2 fertilization are quite important in how much additional value we put onto both intact forests in that case, or also uh, in a forest sequestration in, in, a, in a regrowing forest in a high CO2 world. So they do bear onto what carbon value we put into, into forest protection and, and intact systems. Yeah, that's a great point. Oh, go ahead. So, uh, Fernanda, you have a comment? Yeah, yeah, I want to do a comment. Um, I've been working in work carbon in soils for many years, and it's a very complicated and very tricky uh, uh, subject. Uh, the thing is, there are in the world several examples back about 5,000, 3,000 years ago, where in a way humans, we put carbon in soils and that carbon stayed there. Probably you heard about the uh, terra preta soils in the Amazons, where there are patches of very dark soil. We have examples in, in Germany, uh, China and different places where there was hum, uh, humans made the, the soil in a, in a way we don't know how they do but they store a lot of carbon in that. Mm. So uh, I saw opportunity for store carbon in soil. I don't want to say uh, going to plant trees and do a sequestrated all the carbon in soil. I think this is not feasible and it's temporary, but there is so potential in doing in agriculture, moving to a more agriculture able to uh, increase the pools of carbon uh, now in the soils, we have lost a lot of organic matter and organic, uh, very recalcitrant carbon in the way we do agriculture. And maybe using uh, like cover crops or uh, forests in the age of the sun agricultural land can be contribute to uh, increase that pools. I don't know if we, you have a view on that. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. Yeah, the, yeah, I, I hadn't I hadn't really um, considered the implications of those terra preta soils and the you know more generally those the anthrosols. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. People have done it in the past, right? Um, so there's potential to do it in the future. And it, yeah, it's a it's a case of of switching our the way that we approach agriculture, right? It's a it's a case of changing management, a uh, case of changing some of the crops that we use. Um, I know there are some. There are some folks, uh, uh, um, well, I, I'm sure there are folks all over looking at this, but the, we just had a recent talk this week at, at, at the lab from um, Jennifer Petridge, who was, who was doing some really interesting research into um, putting soil, uh, putting carbon deep down in the soil and using particular biomass crops that have deep roots and other um, characteristics that, that allow them to put soil uh, carbon deep down in the soil. So yeah, I think that, that's it. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, it's a good point. But it, there's there's also the, the the current sort of trend in some of the areas that the sort of area of research that I'm in at the moment is that you know, increased inputs to, a, to the soil don't always lead to increased <laughs> soil carbon. There's a lot of interest in this whole um, priming and, you know, mycorrhizal decomposition of soil, organic matter, and, um, and how that, you know, how that balance between formation and decomposition play out is, is, is uncertain. But I think your point is, yeah, is, is, is a really good one. Thank you. Uh, I think maybe I'll, I'll round off with a slightly, uh philosophical question. Uh, this is a, this topic that you talk about is something that I've been thinking about since being a postdoc in the 1990s and this people here who probably want to remain nameless have been thinking about it for, for even longer than that. And uh, since that time we've got a wealth of new evidence and data and you, you, you've highlighted lots of that data there, lots of experiments, lots of observations, forest networks, uh, space networks, and uh, you know, we have made progress as you've shown. I think we're more confident in the effect it exists. Uh, we're perhaps still not, no more confident in the magnitude of that effect uh, overall. And you know, what is it about the nature of the Earth system that makes it so hard to make progress when there's so much data and so much understanding? And part of it is that, and I think the naivety of our initial framings has been exposed <coughs> when we think about 
a complex diagram that you showed and all the processes that you simply can't relate stimulation of GPP to a carbon sink. There's a lot more that we have to think about there. Uh, but is it something just about the nature of the Earth system and the multitude of processes or spatial, spatial heterogeneity that, that makes such a system problem such difficult ones to really crack despite all the wealth of data that we have? Is it, is it a point of speculation or an answer? Anybody might want to pitch in their, their thoughts there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, it, you know, studying studying the Earth a, as a system is is fundamentally difficult. You know, with with the our general approach to science, you know, we can't put the Earth in a petri dish and study it, right? We can't put it under a microscope. We can't we can't experiment with multiple planets. We've got one planet alone, and so so fundamentally, we need a, a combination of 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 observation and and theory to be able to scale our understanding to, to the, the sort of, to the planetary whole. Um, you know, this, this, we've only got one experiment with our planet, right? And it's what we're doing right now. And so we can't, we can't experiment to find, you know, planetary scale solutions or planetary scale understanding and experiment being like fundamental to, to the scientific method I think um, we have to we have to approach this as a you know in a slightly different way, which is more um, integrative in terms of all of these different data sets, all of the different experiments that we have, and and you know our theoretical understanding as well. Uh, it's kind of a nebulous answer, or not very not particularly satisfying answer, but I think that's why it is. I think you know Earth the Earth as a whole is very difficult to study. Mm -hmm. I guess I think part of your, your framing in terms of ICO2 and ECO2 that captures the problem that either we observe the system as it is over time, and then you have all these co-varying factors, you know, climate change, and all these things that, that, that confuse land use history, confuse our interpretation. Or we do experiments, and then experiments are always somewhat artificial, at least in the time scales. Uh, there's a ramping up CO2 in, in, a, in a short time is different in terms of the responses it induces and then a long-term response. So I guess either our, perf our experiments are imperfect in terms of time scale, or we use what we observe in the natural world and that kind of brings in all these confounding variables that are shifting over time as well. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else there wants to pitch in thoughts on that or insights. Andrew? Yeah, um, sorry to butt in though. I mean, I always think that the problem is really a big one because it's a very, we're looking at this carbon sink, which is actually a very small number compared to the gross fluxes. And there's tremendous variability on all scales. And so actually, you know, doing critical experiments to determine what's behind that small imbalance is, is really tough at large scale. And I think, you know, that, that's the kind of crux of why it's so difficult. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. Okay, anybody else got any, any final comments? If not, thank you, Anthony, for a tour de force. That was a, a, an impressive grounding in everything that we, we need to think about when we're thinking about carbon dioxide fertilization. I think it'll, uh, uh, I think uh, it, it, I'll definitely pointing students and others to, to, to the seminar online uh, as a reference point to start thinking about these things. So as I said, the, the seminar will be on the, on, on the YouTube channel, so feel free to share it. Uh, and uh, nice to see everyone. And uh, I hope, hope to see some of your next week's seminar uh, in the future. So thank you, have a good weekend. Thanks, Edwinda, you too. Good to see everyone.